Thank you, Brother Sullivan. You may be seated. I just can't hardly express myself to thank God that how grateful I am to be back here in this tabernacle tonight. I have long remembered the visit that I had the last time here with Brother Sullivan and the people, and how that the Lord blessed us one Sunday morning in the church. And when I come up just a few minutes ago and heard them people singing, joy in my heart and peace in my mind, that's what Christians sing, what Christians can talk about, having joy in their heart and peace in their mind. And there's nothing can do that but God. And it uh, seems good to be back up here out of the smog of California where you can get a good deep breath once in a while. <laughs> that they can have all the California for my part. Now, I like the people there, but sure not that smog they got down there in that valley. I was born down here on one of these ridges in Kentucky, and I just can't get away from it, you know, I do. <laughs> I, that's, I might be, everybody might rush out there if they want to, but for me, I'd just rather stay up here where the leaves breathe. My eyes burnt, my throat got red, and I, and I tell you, I believe sin kind of travels, well, it always does travel and has traveled with civilization. Uh, sin always comes by civilization. <coughs> Before there was any of the white man in the West, when it was just Indians, they had no sin. They was just lived a good, quiet life, and had little troubles once in a while of their tribal wars and things. But as far as, as sin, it came with the white race when civilization came. Began to come in with women, whiskey, and gambling, and killing. And, and as the sun has went from the east to the west, civilization travels with it. And I believe the Lord must have a great radar screen up on the west coast, because if it goes any further, it'll go back east again. So I think it just sets against it and falls right back like a wave. And I say it certainly is, we're certainly living in a terrible time, yes. terrible time. Now, that don't only apply to the West Coast and me bragging on these uh, Buckeyes and Hoosiers and corn crackers around here, but we got it up here too, you know. But it's just more of it out there. These five nights that we got just now here in Ohio again, I think tomorrow night they're going to some auditorium or something, but I, I was glad to get to come to the church. I like a church. Yes. I, I think that Brother Sullivan, in, in the, the event of travel, is I find that the best meetings is always in churches. Now, I have hope I'm not superstitious. If I am, I don't know it. But then when you go into these places where they have amusements and gambling and dances and it just looks to me like it, there's this little devil sitting around everywhere, you know. <laughs> and they just kind of a, a habitation for them. They just stay there. And then you've got to go in and take about five nights to preach all them out, you know, before you can get the meeting started. But in the church house, I believe the angels of God in camp around Amen. because Amen. of saints gathering there. It's a noted place for God where he comes and meets with his people. It's always seemed kind of good to me to be in a church. I like it better. So you can be, in, it seems like at home, you know, it's, it's uh, where we just fellowship together and have things in common. When Brother Sullivan and we got the opportunity to come back again. I was certainly happy. Just been across the neighbors over here in Virginia last week, and uh, down at Richmond. Had a glorious time down there with those uh, Southerners, uh, birthplace of the nation, they call it. And um, 
They're all good old Southerners, too. They really love the Lord down there, and we had a wonderful time. But uh, I was anxious to get back home again up here so that we could uh, worship together a while. Now, glad to see my friends here from uh, upstate. How far are you away from here, Charlie? How far you live up? About 70 miles. Well, just the inside the Indiana State Line. Rodney and all... Well, this side, this side of the Indiana State Line. He just almost got in grace, but he just missed it a little bit. <laughs> this is the state line. Now, if you come down to Kentucky, you've been just right. Amen. How many Kentuckians is in here? Oh, my. I tell you. <laughs> There's a, I said one time... At, Pardon? What do you think they'd be doing with me? I just don't know, Brother <laughs> My mother used to run a boarding house in Jeffersonville, and I have a tabernacle just about this size, I suppose, there. One night I was preaching, I said, all from Kentucky, stand up. Well, nobody's sitting down. <laughs> and I said, well, Kentuckians and groundhogs took the country that far in a shot. I said, they, they really got right in. <laughs> Come right on over and tuck it. Well, I said, I had to send some missionaries over here from somewhere, so it's pretty... <laughs> I ain't talking about Ohio now. Now, wait a minute. I'm talking about Indiana. <laughs> Down in Indiana. But wherever you go around the world, you find that God's people is always about the same. Amen. I noticed down in Africa and in the other countries where I've been, some of those people wouldn't even know which is right and left hand. But you know what happens when they get the Holy Ghost? What they do? The same thing you do when you get the Holy Ghost. Yeah. Act the same way. And they will, they will speak with tongues. And they, you'd think if they were speaking themselves, when uh, you'd hear their language, like uh, maybe well, there's one kind there that I always was amazed at. They kind of click their tongue as they talk. I believe it's called bazutu. I think it is. No, close eye. And... Um, if you just say close it, it isn't right. You have to click it. Oza. Like, oza. And everything you say has got a click to it. But when they begin to speak with tongues, they sometimes speak English. Mm-hmm. See? And um, just, uh, you, just whenever the people in them heathen countries receive the Holy Ghost, they act just like anybody else, no matter where it's at. They, it shows it's for whosoever will. They come. Now, our, many of our brethren now are standing, and I, I kind of have feel sorry I wished I could uh, furnish them a place to sit down, but we just don't have it, so I won't talk no more than three hours or something like that, I guess. <laughs> and uh, I was just teasing. Um, but just as uh, quick as we can have, feel the... Uh, Lord blessing us and saying it's sufficient, well then we'll want to, we'll dismiss. But to have this time of fellowship around here, the fellow just don't know where to begin at. It's just so wonderful and fine. Been having great meetings on the West Coast, as I was saying. The Lord did bless mightily out on the West Coast this time. I got up around Vesalia uh, up there, and that's Bakersfield. And, Fresno and through there, they were really hungry-hearted people down through those valleys. I believe the reason I'm hungry because God is calling His church together, Amen. feasting upon the Word of God. Now, before we start, we ought to talk to the author, I think, before we read His Word, don't you think so? So let's bow our heads now and lay aside all of our little childish things and look to the most stern, sacred part, the Word. Our Heavenly Father, as we are gathered here tonight in this church, the church that's called by your name, the people that are assembled here are called by your name. And you made us a promise in your eternal Word. If the people that are called by my name shall assemble themselves together and pray, then I'll hear from heaven. Now that's your promise, and we know that you keep all your promises to your people. We thank you for the church and for every person that's represented here. 
in every church that's represented. And we pray, Lord, that you'll bless us together as your believing children. Tonight we'd ask especially for our gracious, loyal brother Sullivan, that you would bless him exceedingly abundantly, seeing his heart's desire is to serve you and to do something for you and to uh, make all of his hours count for the kingdom, bringing into the city ministers different ministers with different types of ministry that they might serve the purpose and they might feed the flock to which the Holy Spirit has made them overseer. We thank you for this. And as it's our choice now, if it be thy will to feed the flock for the next four or five days here, we pray that the Holy Spirit will furnish the sheep food the Word, bring it forth with power and manifestations of the Holy Ghost. Bless us as we wait on Thee. Save all those that are savable, Lord. Fill this believer that's waiting patiently to receive the Holy Ghost. We pray that You'll let everyone in that condition go away from here tonight happy both saved and filled with the Spirit. Heal the sick, Lord. Thou hast given us the commission, go into the city, heal the sick that's in the, that city. Or, and preach that the kingdom is at hand. God, we pray that you will grant these things to us as your servants, as your ambassadors, because we do believe that the kingdom is at hand. And help us to bring forth that word in that manner that people might see and believe on thee. And that that great reckoning day that's coming to all. May because of our efforts there will be literally hundreds stand there redeemed by the blood. Because of the efforts that we're trying to put forth now. Fathers, we come together, we talk as children, we are happy. Now we pray that you'll let us lay aside that and move into the kingdom work. Be subjects to the Holy Spirit, for we ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Now by way of a little context, I might call your attention to 1 Corinthians, the 14th chapter, and the 8th verse. For if the trumpet gives an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself for battle? We are living in an uncertain time. Almost everything that we look at today is uncertain. We're living in a time when it seems like you can hardly put your hand on anything that's certain. Our national security, very uncertain. We find that in that, while we, the whole, I say the international security, because that we're just at the end of the age. Amen. A few days ago in California, there was a, a message that was given when a Baptist brother come uh, to lay or shake my hand after the businessman's meeting at the, at the Clifton's cafeteria breakfast. Is Marilyn Monroe's brother, I think it was, the movie star. He's a Baptist, and he started to shake hands with me. When he did, he went to talking in unknown tongues. And there happened to be a present, a woman from Louisiana. And she understood French, and she said the boy spoke French. He said, I don't know one word of French. And then when she gave the interpretation to what he said, the interpreter of the UN was there. And 
come to the lady and to the, the businessman and said, the lady interpreted exactly right. Said, he interprets at the UN, giving a message to me. And then, I believe it was the senator of some state, we're just talking to Brother Shakarian and up in Greenland where this nation is prepared from Greenland to destroy the earth with atomic weapons. Just one touch and any nation will go plumb off the earth. See, the only thing we hear is just, we got a bomb, we'll do certain, certain things, but they got it bigger than that, you know, they don't, you don't let your, all your secrets out when it's in national affairs. And this man is coming to Miami in July where I'm to hold a meeting at Miami, Florida. And there was a, a missile got in a screen. And they something in the screen and this man had orders to pull a lever. And that would have been it. But he said himself that he could not pull it, which would have loosed, I don't know how many big rockets of bombs and whatever more, and the battle would have been on. But something wouldn't let him pull it. I wonder if that was God, <laughs> that there's somebody here that's not saved yet, Hallelujah. that it just can't happen till that takes place. That just shows how close we are. Amen. See, the angel said to Lot, get out of here because I can do nothing till thou hast come hither. Amen. He has to get out first before he could do anything about it. So, years ago, the big nations were predominant. Those who had great uh, ships and many men like China and Russia and the United States, they were predominant nations. That's no more. Any little nation can just destroy the whole earth. So there's no more in size of it. It's just waiting for time. Now let's not look at that too lightly. Oh, you say, Brother Branham, I've, I've heard such things as that before I know it. But you're going to hear it one time, the last time. And everything else so close to hand, I'm just listening for it most any time. And what kind of a people should we be at this time? The sinner ought to be screaming for mercy, and the Christian ought to be shouting the praises of God. Right? Amen. right? Someone said, one time said, Brother Branham, you scare people by saying Jesus is coming so quickly. Well, it's a horrible thing to think that our world is coming to the end. I said, not for the Christian. It's the most glorious thing he can have on his mind. Amen. It's to think that our Lord might come at any time. Hallelujah. It'll all be changed then. It'll be over. I believe the boy's got a little book here that the businessman printed uh, the vision that the Lord just gave me recently. I hope you get to read it. Um, yes, Paul said, I have fought a good fight and finished the course and kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness that the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me at that day. And not only me, but to all who love is appearing. Oh, when you love the Lord, it takes all the fear out. Amen. You're just going to meet Him. Recently, when an old friend of mine, Dr. F. F. Bosworth, died down in Miami, I went down to see him. He's about way close to 90 years old. And I said to him, I said, uh, Brother Bosworth, what was the happiest time of your life? You've been preaching now for about 55 or 60 years. He said, this is the most glorious hour I've ever lived. And I said, what would, why would you say that? Just question the old saint. He said, Brother Branham, all I've lived for since I was a young man has been Jesus Christ. 
And he said, at most any minute, I'm looking for him to come in the door to take Amen. me with him. He said, it's the most glorious all I could ever think or the most glorious expectations that I could ever have is to know that soon now I'll be in the hands of my Lord to be with him forever. That's real Christian dying. Amen. That's not real Christian dying. That's real Christian going to be with him. Amen. Like Paul Rader said when he was dying, Los Angeles, as we call death, he called his brother Luke. He said, think of it, Luke. We've been a long time together. But said, in five minutes from now, I'll be standing in the presence of Jesus Christ, clothed in his righteousness. Amen. Squeezed his brother's hand and went to meet him. All oh, that makes me think of Longfellow's Psalm of Life. Lives of great men all remind us and we can make our lives sublime. With partings leave behind us footprints on the sands of time. How oh, that encourages the Christian. I had a book, I suppose I've got it somewhere at home, of great men, last words before they left the world. Both sinner and saint. I got Dwight Moody's and many of the other great saints that left the world. Moody, when death struck him, he said, and you call this death? He said, this is my carnation day. And queens, uh, one queen of England, very wicked, said that she would give her kingdom for 15 more minutes of life. See, the end of the road tells. And that's where we are, at the end of the road. There's no certainty in national security anymore because you can't dig far enough under the earth to keep them from blowing you out. You can't. There's nothing to do. We're just at the end of the road. And we take then and some of the other things, there's no certainty. I was hearing on the newscast coming up here that there's more jobless people now than there was during the time of uh, President Hoover's depression time. More jobless people than there was during... His administration, and during a time of 19 and 30, along in there, many of us of that age remembers it, when we'd eat a little bit of potatoes with little jackets on them and deep jacket and all, because you just got them once in a while and having breakfast, dinner, and supper, how hard it was. And now, because they can say that, there's almost a third more people in the United States than there was then. And the other day, coming in Richmond, Louisville, and many places, you know, I think it's some of our leadership that brings this on. Seeing on the street corner women policemen. What business has a woman got being a policeman? Wrestling with drunks and things out there. That ought to be a man's job. If they put some of these women back in the kitchen where they belong, man would have more jobs. There'd be more of it. But they, it's just that hour old, jobless, no time. There's nothing left hardly to, but the coming of the Lord to rectify all things. Jobs, home life is uncertain. We've never had a time when we had so many divorces in peacetime as we got now. Our home life is broke up. Years ago, it used to be that that mother and dad was home at night if it wasn't for church times or something, and they never let their children roam the streets and run around all night long. And nowadays, it seems to be kind of a popular opinion. Oh, how you just go to the uh, modern home today. Look what it is. Papa, he has to hurry down to the pool room. Their boys are playing pool or they're bowling or something. Him and Ma. Sisters at the canteen somewhere, out some rock and roll party. Junior's got the hot rod, out seeing how many can run down. And that's about home life. And the Bible? 
Oh, it's a great book, but it's put in a drawer somewhere until pastor comes in or somebody. And we just don't have the home life we used to have. It's a the home life is so uncertain. A man nowadays getting married, you young fellows, you better pray a long time. Ask God to give you a companion. You young women the same way. Because it is so uncertain. California, I find out over there that I, I think it was either 15 or 20 percent, something like that, of perversion, perverted people has increased in the last year or two. Oh, it's, it's terrible. And it, home life is uncertain. Politics, uncertain. There's no certainty in politics anymore. The parties can't even have any certainty. There's not any fairness among them anymore. Now, someone might say you shouldn't mention politics in the pulpit. That is true. But decency and Christianity are being mentioned in the pulpit. That's right. I... Not a politician. I'm a Christian. Both sides is corrupt. But just recently in the presidential election, even they had to go back and found these voting machines that when you fixed up so when you vote for one, you you have to vote for the other also. Crooked. They don't know who got elected. They can't tell anymore. No certainty in it. You put them down to count the votes and somebody's crooked enough to count them the wrong way. Parties pulling to get their man in. No honesty. Now, if Mr. Kennedy would have been a Republican or, or whatever Democrat Mr. Nixon made no difference. The thing is wrong when machines are set up to vote wrong. And the FBI proved that it was done, but they didn't do nothing about it. <laughs> See? Why? You wonder why such things get so over the face of the people. How it ever happens? It's because these things have to be. We're at the end time. It has to be there. This man had to be elected. We're at the end. And I'm sure that you can make two and two make four. That we're at the end time. Yes. And these machines, no matter how much they would prove that they crooked it, it has to remain the way it is. And someone said to me, a minister called me up, one of the sponsors on the following meeting, one of the following meetings in the nation, said, I hear that you are preach so much against uh, the sisters in our church cutting their hair and, and wearing shorts and things. I said, I do. I said, now, if, if you don't want to listen to that, then don't stand for me. See? And uh, he said, do you think you'll ever stop it? I said, no. You believe you'll ever stop sin? He said, no. I said, well, what are you preaching this for then? See? What's wrong is wrong. Somebody's got to breed out against it. Right? Tell the truth. For when the wrath of God is poured out, then you won't, you'll be without excuse. Yes, political, politics, jobs, national security, everything is uncertain. Now we're coming down to the church. The church, so-called, is uncertain. Now we've got about 900 different denominations in the, this United States. Now, and every one against the other one. So where do you know what, what do you know what to do about it? You're just, it's just the end time. We're at the end road. And as much as I respect those, each one of those, I would rather have a Methodist here, Baptist there, Presbyterian here, and so forth, than have them all over the country. 
and they have bootleg joints and dives and things, they'll do a little good no matter where they're at. It's little missions and, and like someone said, and I hope I don't hurt anyone's feelings, when someone said I'd rather be a, a Camelite than have no light at all. So I guess that's about right. Now, no matter what it is, they'll do a, a little good. And we need them all. But that wasn't God's program. That was our program to make our churches and denominations. We tried it in the Garden of Eden. It's as old as Eden was. Religion means a covering. And Adam tried to cover himself to make his own way. Cover himself up. But it didn't work. There's only one place that God ever meets man. That's not in his education. It's not in his denomination, his affiliation. It's under the blood. Amen. That's the only place that God ever did or ever will meet mankind is under the blood. Amen. That's the place. Amen. God laid down the program in the Garden of Eden by the shed blood. And if God ever makes a decision, he can never change it because he's perfect and everything that he does and says is perfect. Therefore, he cannot change his program as long as there is a world, as long as there is a sinner. There's only one way since the Garden of Eden, when sin was first committed, until the last sin will be made. There's only one plan of redemption. That's through the shed blood. Amen. Nothing else will work. Our creeds, our denominations, and everything has played a part, and a good part. But it isn't God's program. His program is back to the blood. Amen. So churches has also got uncertain sounds. One of them says, the days of miracles is past. Now, that's very uncertain to the Bible. The other one says, why, well, uh, different things, and you got to recite this creed, and you got to do this and that, and so forth. Well, so uncertain because there's too many of them. They make up all kinds of uh, uh, different things uh, against one another. One contrary to this and contrary to that. And about 95% of it contrary to the Bible. So there's an uncertain sound amongst the churches, amongst politics, amongst home. Everything seems to be uncertain. Now, the Bible said here in 2 Timothy 3 and 7 that these days would come. It said that they would be heady, high-minded, Lovers of pleasure more than the lovers of God. Lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Amen. Now that is right. The television has come into the home and holds people away from the prayer meetings. It's got an attraction to it that's attractive and beautiful. And I don't say that some of their programs isn't all right. There's a lot of it that isn't. We know that. But I don't, yes, 99% of it isn't all right. But say there would be 1% of it. Well, what you get in that 1%, would you mean to give up that 1% for the church of the living God where it's 100% right? Hallelujah. Stay away on Wednesday night from prayer meetings. But sin is attractive. Any way you take it, sin is attractive. To the human being, because he's a subject of, of the fallen race that we are, and it's attractive, Satan knows how to make it attractive. He's a, he's a genius at his job, and he, if he can't get it out there in the world affair, he brings it right into the church. He comes right over on our own ground. That's the reason, brethren, sisters. We should recognize him. It's time that the church was spiritual. To recognize, know God. Not by creed, not by denomination, but by experience. Of being filled with the Holy Ghost. A few days ago over in California, I just come out of Beaumont, different places where we've been having meetings and the anointing of the Holy Spirit was great upon me at the time like it gets on you and the rest of us. And you can walk out on the street and just 
deal the pressure. Now, if you don't have that anointing on you, you don't pay much attention to it. You just go along. Listen, church. That's the reason that someone thinks I'm real hard on them. It isn't that. I don't want to be rough on people. But if you just come down under the anointing, to where you can feel the presence of God, then walk into the presence of sin. Yeah. It turns you around. Yeah. And you can't hold your peace. Got to say something. Amen. And it's the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And when you say to people, uh, are you a Christian? Well, quickly they'll tell you they belong to a certain denomination or organization. See, and they're, they're satisfied with that. They seem to think that that's all that suffices. That's all it has to be. If they belong to a, a certain organization, that's all they have to do. Well, that used to be we call them people the cold form of Baptists and Methodists. But now it's a cold form of Pentecostals got that way too. It's, it's in the Pentecostal church. Each one wants to say, I belong to this or I... And that's all right. I'm not condemning that. That's fine. But what you want to be, if you profess Pentecost, Pentecost is an experience. Amen. For a man or a woman, boy or girl, that's born again with a Pentecostal experience Hallelujah. of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. And as soon as you receive that, the whole world seems to weight you down. Oh, you yoked yourself up with Christ. And it brought... Tears to his eyes and grief, even death to his body. When the world in that day was so sinful, what do you think it does today? I was in a place, I believe it was in Athens or somewhere, and I, I seen a, a picture like a plate on a wall. No, I'm, I'm sorry. I've got it on a, on a recording or a picture of the famous picture of three minutes until midnight that science says that's where we're living. Three minutes of midnight. And that was said about three or four or five years ago. I believe we're into the seconds now of the ticking away of time. Now, I can be wrong, but it just seems that way to me. And they had a picture of Christ like on a plate, and teardrops, as he looked down to the earth, were dropping off of his face. I wonder if this isn't about like it was in the days of Noah, when God said it even grieved him that he made man. I wonder if it hasn't gotten to about that place again tonight, that the very man that he created and gave himself for, and redeemed that to redeem that man, he spurns it back in his face. This horrible age that we're living in of just joining church. That's if you think that you are a Christian and something told you you was a Christian because you made a confession and joined church, that's an uncertain sound. That's the reason today people are not interested in a revival. That's the reason the world don't want it. We've got to have a certain sound to it. A certain sound. And the reason today that when we have a protractive meeting or a gathering together, they don't get the real certain sound. But when they had a revival on the day of Pentecost, there came a certain sound from heaven like a Russian mighty wind that filled all the house where they were setting. That was a certain sound. It was a, an evidence that God was in the midst of them. The church today, just like it was in, in Eden, at the east of the gate, there was Cain, he made a, an altar he built it there and erected in memorial of Jehovah. He wasn't an infidel. He made the altar and in commemoration of Jehovah and 
put a sacrifice on it and laid himself on the altar and called out to God. And God refused his calling out because it didn't have the right sound. There was nothing there to cry out that was dying. There was nothing, no death to appease him that sin had to be paid for by death. The day you eat thereof, that day you die. And he put flowers and made it pretty. But there was nothing there to say that there was death. And from the altar of Abel came the cry of a lamb. There was death to pay the penalty. Blood was being shed. And today, when God, just like it was in that day when he told Cain, Cain was discouraged. He said, here's the best I can do. You can take it or leave it. Do anything you want to about it. But that's all I can do about it. That's the way the modern Christian worships today. I go to church. I help the preachers. I pay my tithings. I, 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 if they got any social party, I, I, I put my part on it. And if, uh, if they need a missionary offering, I, I help in it. That's good. But that's not what God requires. He's got to hear the sound of death. Bless God. What God wants today is you to die. Die to the things of the world and yourself. He'll scream, Lord, take me as I am. That's what God wants. He wants that sound of death. That death rattle of old man Adam that's dying. That he might come in and take his place and rule you and be your Lord. Oh, what a time that we are living. Now we see, God told Cain, he said, go ahead and worship like your brother Abel and you'll do well. Go ahead and do the way he's doing. It'll be all right with you. But if he didn't sin, lay at the door. And the same thing today. So we find that there's no certain sound to the church. The church so-called. Now the church, we make the church today call the church an organization. We say that's the church. Uh, what church do you belong to? Well, there's only one church. There's only one. There's many organizations, but one church. Many organizations. And as I want to make it clear, I have nothing against them. They've played a great part, but that's not it yet. It's not it. To the church means the called out, Amen. the separated. Yeah. And two people can't live in you at the same time. You've got to die out to the things of the world to serve God. You can't love God and mammon at the same time. And as long as the love of the world is in the, the, the believer's heart, he crowds out and deprives himself from the privileges that God's giving. Amen. 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 God don't want you to be underprivileged. He wants you to have every privilege that He died for. Every privilege He gave the church, He wants you to enjoy it. It's yours. What if I bought my little boy a bicycle? Or, and he'd throw it back in my face and say, I don't want the thing. Unappreciated. What if you bought your little girl a, a little dolly and she picked it up and throwed it back at you? Ungrateful. See, that's the way we are when we try to live under the privileges that God gave us. Christ died that we might have these privileges. And how he must feel today when we've adopted some other program and throwed the Holy Spirit back in his face and said, we don't need that fanaticism anymore. I'll just uh, join church. I, I'm, uh, you can't join church. There's no such a thing as joining church. You, you might join an organization. But you can't join church because you have to be born in the church. Amen. You Amen. cannot join into it. Amen. You've got to be born into it. Amen. And all believers are born into the church of God. Amen. The church, of, not the organization church of God, but the church of the living God, which is Christ raised from the dead Amen. and a living among us. That's Now, then there's uncertain sounds when they say, I'm Pentecostal, uh, 
assemblies. I'm Pentecostal and United. I'm Pentecostal uh, Church of God. I'm Pentecostal Holiness. I'm Methodist. I'm Baptist. I'm Presbyterian. All those things, they're all right as far as that goes. <clears throat> I don't mean to be sacrilegious by saying this. The old colored fellow eating watermelon, they give him a slice of it, fix it all up and he eat it and he just slid down it like that and beat the seeds out of the side of his mouth. Said, how'd you like that, Mose? He looked at the other big part of it, show where that one little piece come out. He said, boss, it was good, but there's some more of it. <laughs> so that's the way it is. These organizations is all right, but there's some more of it. More of it. That's what we want. More of it. Yes. Ever learning, never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, and despisers of those that are good. Did you notice that? At the beginning of the chapter said the Spirit speaks expressingly that in the last days, that would be the condition, in the last days, man should be lovers of the self, proud boasters, blasphemers, or unholy, without natural affections, not even natural affections, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, and despisers of those that are good, having a form of godliness. Now, that is God's Word, and it has to be fulfilled. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. Don't you see? They've got away from that certain sound. They took an uncertain sound. Come in and said, we joined church, we were baptized, and we put our name on the book. Now, that's an uncertain sound. And one of the biggest hypocrites in the world is to have a sound that's almost like a real sound and it's got enough about it not to be the right sound. The biggest lie that was ever told is one that's got a whole lot of truth to it and then right at the end it's got a lie. That's the way that Satan told Eve. She was deceived by it. The woman didn't mean to be, but she was deceived because it sounds so truthful. See? And when they tell you you can just join church and be all right or be sprinkled or baptized a certain thing or do something, it'll be all right. That's, that's not it, brother. A man's got to be born again of the water and of the Spirit and filled with the Holy Ghost. Then he's a new creature. Then you've got a certain sound that sounds right. Now, when the sound comes in, it changes the hearing conditions in your ears. See? Before you couldn't hear it. Now you can hear it. Somebody preached about divine healing, the power of God. You'd sit there just uncircumcised in the ears as you could be. Couldn't hear a thing. My pastor don't believe that. I believe that's fanaticism. But when another sound comes like a rushing mighty wind and circumcises those ears, then that's a beautiful sound when you go to hear that sound of the rushing mighty wind. Oh, first thing you know, it brings springs of joy to your soul and you holler, Amen. That's right. Preach it, brother. Hallelujah. That's good. See, it's got you moving now and you're going somewhere. But today, it's just join the church. See, it's an uncertain sound. Heady, high-minded lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. That's Second Timothy, uh, Timothy 3 and 7. Ever learning, never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. See, ever learning. Ever learning. Brother, we got seminaries and schools and PhDs and DHDs and DDDs and QSTs and... All kinds of everything, ever learning, but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. That's right. Got a doctor's degree, and we send our child away in the uh, seminary somewhere and get him a great big degree or something like that, and he come out, and, and he, he, he still there's something wrong. You can't... Now, what we need today, and let me straighten my statement, today, preaching a minister... A gospel preacher is not a man so much could be. He could still have this and be a preacher. But we rely upon uh, a degree that we got. How we got our Bachelor of Art and how we took Bible and learned this. The devil knows more about the Bible than you'll ever know. I tell you that now. He knows all about it. And one of some of the best Bible students I ever met was infidels. They just studied it day and night. That's right, to fuss with you about it. 
It is, the Bible isn't to be fussed about. The Bible is to be lived. Amen. See, if you put that seed into an unfertile ground, it won't live. But if you put it into fertile ground, it'll live. Did you read here not long ago how they went and got some of that wheat out of the garner in Egypt that was put in there by Joseph? Got sunflower seed, 4,000 years old. Sunflower seed, 4,000 years old. Planted in the ground, it brought forth a sunflower. Amen. Wheat brought forth wheat. Why? It was germatized. That germ doesn't die. See, it's in there. No matter where they put you, if you're born again and filled with the Holy Ghost, you might not be a, 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 even a, enough ashes to hold on your little fingernail. But you'll come forth again at the resurrection because you got life. You've been endued with power and on high, and there's life in you. There's a sound taking place. A sound, a certain sound that you know what happened. You died and was born again. You become a new creature. Uncertain sounds. Uncertain sound of the jobs. Uncertainty in national affairs. Uncertainty in politics. Uncertainty in home. Then you might say to me, Brother Branham, you're saying everything's uncertain. Is there anything that is certain? Yes, there's one thing that's certain. I must, it's eternally true. It's eternally uh, certain. Oh, you can never get away from it. It's a chapter. Jesus said, uh, 35th verse, he said, Heavens and earth will pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Then it's eternal certain. Now, see, we can't no more put confidence in national affairs and jobs and politics and, and our denominations and so forth. But there's one thing that is certain. That is God's word and God's promise. When God says anything, that settles it forever. Amen. Here some time ago, they tried to say that, that God made so many mistakes. You know, they said that when... A David played on his heart. Science absolutely tried to prove that there was no such a thing as a harp in the days of David. They didn't have no harps. But finally they dug up some evidence that there was harps. Said when Abraham took his camels and went out into Greer, they said that there never was no camels down in there. But here just recently they dug up some bones and found there was camels down there. See? So they said that the Bible is untrue. They go dig down and find the, what they call the Garden of Eden. Prove it's just a beginning of a civilization somewhere. And when they dug down trying to disprove the Bible, they dug up this, on a rock where it had been written where Isaiah healed Hezekiah with barrels just to prove that. And they said that the walls of Jericho did not fall down. There was no such a thing. They dug all around there and there was no such thing as walls. And some certain doctor went out there and dug down, on, down, on, down, and found out there they was 20 or 30 feet below where they, they'd been digging, and there they was, lapped on top of one another, just exactly the way the Bible said. So God was right after all. Amen. They said back your great, great, great grandfather, if he was a critic, he said, there cannot be a carriage ever go without a horse hitched to it, but we got it anyhow. Amen. That's right. And all these things. That God spoke of their eternal truth. Here some time ago, it was questioned about Solomon in the Bible when he said, As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Well, then the scientist said, Looky here. There's no mental faculties in a human heart. Solomon meant his head. <laughs> if he had meant head, he'd said head. That's it. I believe the Bible to be just exactly the way it's wrote. Just, I believe that's God's Word. Just, I believe it is God. God is no better than His Word. You're no better than your Word. Your own words, what's going to stand there to judge it that day? Now, in Chicago about four years ago, a Brother Matson Bose's little girl, Joyce, is to be married next month. Lovely little girl. She's... Uh, always telling me something and laughing, just always having a little joke to tell me, saying um, about something. It, it's a little crack she has to make about something. And she says to me, she said, did you uh, hear uh, what was in the paper today? And I said, 
I said, no, wait a minute, Joyce. Now, what, why don't you go tell me now? What can... I said, no, this is not. Brother Bram said, I'll bring it to you and show you. I said, I heard you say about man thinking in his heart. I read it in the Bible. She said, now, today they have found it and proved it. It's not in, the, it's not in no other heart but the human heart. It isn't in an animal heart. But there's a little compartment in the heart that science says is the place where the soul abides. So, therefore, God was right when he said, as a man thinketh in his heart. See, there is a mental faculty in the heart. Now, when you uh, say, well, now, uh, uh, I, I, you ever, all of you said this. Times that when you would think, well, I, I don't know whether it could happen or not. And all at once something just tells you it's going to happen regardless of what anybody else says. You know it's going to happen. We've all had them experiences. That's when your heart's thinking. That's your heart telling you. Now, the mind reasons, but the heart doesn't reason. It just believes it. If I could ever drive that home to one of my audience, I'd have a real healing service. If I could ever get my audience to see that. That it's not what your head thinks at all. That's where the devil abides. But he reasons it out. I, I'm sick. I can't get well. I, I got this. I can't be saved. I, I, I've done too much. See, that's reason. But we are to cast down reasonings. That's right, casting down our reasonings, we believe with our heart. Hallelujah. In the Garden of Eden, man was divided in two parts. The devil took his head and God took his heart. The devil makes him look at things and say, well, it just can't happen, I can reason it out. And God took his heart to dwell in his heart to make him believe things that his head don't even know nothing about. Yeah. That's right. God. So Amen. it's in your heart, you think. Down here, that's where the real certain sound comes from. It's from the heart. That's where God talks, and here's where the devil talks from. So let's cast down what the devil said and take a certain sound. And that certain sound is God talking in the heart. That's true. God's promises. Let's just interview for the next three or four minutes by some that took his promises. And whether they were realities or not. They didn't reason about them. God makes you think of things and do things that's unreasonable to the human head. Did you know that? Yes. Here's a little boy sitting here in a chair, a wheelchair. Perhaps maybe his mom and papa might have brought him, and he, uh, maybe the doctor's done everything for him they can do. See? Uh, he said, it's all over. Well, now, if you're going to listen to what he tells you, then it's all over. But if there's something begins to work down in here, brother, that, that's different then. That's another sound. Now, this sound says it's over. But this sound is a certain sound. It'll deny this one. Now, it depends on... And this one will try to deny that one, but vice versa. But it depends on which one you listen to. Like the Indian was that time he got saved. said, how are you getting along, chief? said, well, since I got saved, these two dogs and me, and said, one's white and one's black. And the white one wants me to do right, and the black one wants me to do wrong, so they're fighting all the time. He said... Well, how do, you, how do you get along? Which one wins, chief? He says, depends on which one chief feeds the most. Well, that's it. If you're going to listen to reason, you'll always have this fellow conquered. But if you'll ris- listen to the certain sound, God's Word, working in your heart, you'll conquer this one. Which one do you feed? Don't listen to the uncertain sound. Because we have... Absolutely evidence down through every age that God works miracles, performs things that science knows nothing about. That's right. Amen. So don't pay no attention to what this fellow says. When this fellow goes to talking, let this fellow get out of the way. Right. Now, we take, for instance, just the two or three people in the Bible that listen and never talk their reasonings. They talk to their, this certain sound. God met Noah. And he said, Noah, it's going to rain. And I I want you to build an ark now for the saving of your household. Now, did you know it had never rained a drop on the earth till that time? It had never been no rain. Now, could you imagine when science, you say, well, oh, yes, they was too. They come out of the line of Cain. Yes, sir, great scientists. Far beyond what we have today, greater science. They built the Sphinx and the pyramids in them days. We can't do that today. They had materials as, and they had powers that was beyond anything that we've got. Unless it is the atomic. They had it harnessed. 
And they did things that we don't know nothing about. They could make a mummy in them days. We couldn't do it today if we had to. No such thing as making a mummy today, but they did. See? They could embalm in such a way to make them look natural plumb on until this day, thousands of years later. We don't have that. They had dye that would last. And just many things there that we don't have. Their science was advanced to us. Now, science might have said, now, I want to ask you something. Where in the world is that water coming from? I can see it all the way up to the stars. I can see all the way to the moon. I can see all the way to the sun. We got instruments here that can shoot a message over to the moon. We can go over to the stars and go over to Mars. Things like that. Tell me where the water is at, please, Mr. Noah. Well, I'll tell you. I heard a sound one day, and it was the voice of God that told me to build an ark. And I just as sure as there is a world that we're living in, God's going to destroy it with water. And it's going to rain right down out of that heaven. God's able to put it up there. If He said it would come, He'll make a way of it. Right. Now, if it hadn't have been sure and know that that sound was certain, the first critic had said, well, maybe I... Maybe I misunderstood. <laughs> That's the way people do today. The doctor say, you're no better. Well, maybe I misunderstood. Maybe I... I... <laughs> oh, my. See, but if you're sure of that certain sound, if the trumpet gives an uncertain sound, who can prepare himself for battle? If it's uncertain, what would a soldier do if, if it was uh, this preparing for battle and, and it, uh, they give the sound and it didn't sound just like the, the regular sound to go to battle? He wouldn't know whether to retreat, whether to go to battle, or where to sit down, or, or eat his dinner, or what to do, or go to bed, <laughs> if it didn't give a certain distinction in the sound. So God's Word doesn't make any scruples. It gives a certain sound. Certain sound. When God speaks to an individual, it's certain. I don't care what anybody else says, what science says, what the nation says, what the world says, what the church says, what anybody else says. It's certain. God's Word is a certain sound. Every man that ever heard it and obeyed it done something, too. Now, Noah, being warned of God, moved and prepared an ark to the saving of his household. That was a certain sound. God said it's going to rain, and it rained. And those who found a way of escape took it. Those who didn't perished. The same God that said it will rain, said fire is going to fall from heaven and destroy the world. Amen. There's a way prepared for you. Those who will take it will escape it. Those who do not will perish. The sinner will perish with the sinful world. But the redeemed will be redeemed by the Holy Spirit. Noah stood right in the door of that ark and brought judgment upon the earth. Judge them people because they did not believe the message what God was going to do in it. He brought the wrath of God upon the earth. But standing in the door of his ark and preaching justification, stood in the door and proclaimed God's word because it was manifested to him as a certain sound that God was going to do it. Tonight is your brother. I stand in the door of this ark, Christ Jesus, and declare to you that He's a Savior, a healer, a coming King. And from these messages of ministers in the door will bring the wrath of God and judgment upon the nations, upon the world. It's a certain sound. We know it. It's God's Word. And all that doesn't seek Christ for salvation will perish. They that sin will perish with sin. They of the world will perish with the world. Noah rode above it in his ark because he stood in the door of the only preparation God had of escape. And I say today that your church won't save you. Your creed won't save you. It will take God to save you, the Holy Spirit. And you're baptized by the Holy Ghost into the ark of Christ Jesus. For by one Spirit we're all baptized into one body. The only thing that will save you. Hear it. Don't take the uncertain sign. I'm Methodist. I'm Baptist. I'm Pentecostal. I've done this. I've did this. I... Don't take that. That's an uncertain sound. But when God comes in, that's a certain sound. You know about it. 
All as long as you ever live on this earth, you'll still know it. It's something that happens to you. It was a certain sound. It made Noah act crazy before it was manifested, before it was brought to pass. So is the church today that accepts Christ and has been born of the Holy Ghost. The people think those people are crazy. Some of them said, Brother Branham, are you still a Baptist? I said, no, I'm a Pentecostal. A what? I said, a Pentecostal. What do you mean? I said, I've been born of the Spirit of God and received the Holy Ghost. I said, I'm a Pentecostal. He said, oh, you went off the deep end? I said, no, I just heard a certain sound. And it, here's where it come from. It rung right out of the pages of this Bible. This is clear as a bell. When I received it, I know what happened. I was there. I know it took place. Certain. It changed me from death to life. It done something for me. It's a certain sound. It, I know I act crazy to people. And you act crazy to people, too. You have received it. But we know where we're standing. We know what we're talking about. It's a real sound. It's just the same kind of sound that comes in the Bible makes us act the same way. It'll make the black man, yellow man, brown man all act the same because it's the same sound. Amen. A certain sound. The trumpet gives an uncertain sound. Well, I could be Methodist, Baptist, Presbyterian, Pentecostal, the name, whatever more. See, there's no certainty to that. But when that certain sound comes, then you know it. It's a certain sound. Now, how about Noah standing there preaching away that it's going to rain while the people laughed at him? But one day it was made manifest. That's right. Noah pounded right away, stood right away, and just kept putting the timbers on, pounding. Then he got out there and he pitched the ark. He put pitch in it. Now, it was made out of chitim wood, and if you notice, that's the lightest wood there is. It's lighter than balsam. And that's what the ark's made out of. That's what, that's what you're made out of, the timbers in this ark. It's made out of, of a thin wood, a light wood. What do they do with it? They have to take all the sap out of it and make it light, dry it out until it gets real dry. And then it's flexible. You can use it. So much in us, every time we start to bend, we break. But you have to get all the, the whirly sap out of you. All the world sap out of you. And then hold it over fire. Fire will draw the sap out. And I'll tell you, that's what it takes to draw the sap out of us now. The whirly sap. Then what did they do with it? They took a tree and cut out a rosin tree. And instead of of uh, just cutting it down, they took it and beat it. And they beat that tree until they beat the rosin out of it. Then they took the rosin out of that and poured it into this shed of wood. And when it did, it filled up all these crevices and it's harder than steel. That's right. Then it was in the ark. And God pitched it on the outside, or, Mo, or Noah did, and on the inside and outside he pitched it. Well, that's exactly the way God told him to build it. And that's the way we build it today. We can't pour these waters and things into the church and make it anything. You can be baptized face forward, backward, whatever you will. It won't do no good. Not a bit. We argue about creeds, about sprinkling, about pouring, about this, that, and the other. But what good does it do if that's all you got? That's right. And I said, uh, I don't know where they ever... Was. One time when I was a little boy, there was, brother and I was out back the farm and there was... We found an old turtle, and he was, you know how they walk with their feet like that funny-looking thing? And Brother and I thought that's the funniest-looking creature we ever saw. So when I got right up to him, I went, draw back in like that. It's like, you know, you go to preaching the gospel, and literally laying it on, you see them old turtles just, you know, draw back in the hull. Mm-hmm. Yes. And I went up to him, and I said, I wonder if we could make him walk. Well, we, we pinched him, and we done everything we could. He, he wouldn't walk. Pushed him, kicked him around, and it didn't make him walk. Well, I went over and got me a switch, and I poured it on him, and he, he didn't walk. And I said, well, and, uh, yeah, that's it. You, you, can't, you can't whip it into him. So then I said, I, I, I'll fix him, brother. We went out to the spring down there, and a hole of water. I just stuck him down there. I said, I'll drown him real walk. I held him down there, and just a few bubbles come up, and that's all. He's just all right. Brother, yeah, water don't do it. But you know how I made him walk? I got me a piece of paper and made a little fire and set him on it. Brother, he walked then. Yep. 
If there's anything that will make the church walk right, do right, show itself, is the baptism of the Holy Ghost and fire coming down from God out of heaven to straighten the church out. Not a fuss about this or fuss about that, but a baptism of the fiery love of God that comes down and sweeps the things out of your heart and makes you a new creature in Christ Jesus. Women let their hair grow out and man will quit smoking cigarettes and I tell you, and all these things will straighten out. If you just get the fire down on it. True. Now, it seemed awful strange to Noah when he was doing this, but he was heard that certain sound. And that's what he wanted. Now, let's take another fellow. There was a man by, by the name of Moses on the backside of the desert, just as full of doctoring as he could be. He knew all the, the ins and outs of all things. He could even teach the Egyptians, the smartest people in the world. He could teach them some theology. But one day out there, he, he saw something on fire, and it kind of attracted him. That's what it needs today is a church on fire to attract some of these Moses around here somewhere, to attract some of these sinners. It takes fire to give an attraction. You let a, a, a scream go up the street, a fire reel, everybody jump in their car and try to follow it. There's something attractive about a fire. What we need tonight is Holy Ghost and fire. That'll attract the believer. I see something. I remember an old friend of mine named Ben Timberman. Oh, he's quite a fellow. Over in St. Louis. He had a tent meeting going on down there and nobody would attend it. So he run down the street there, a little piece right in the middle of the town. He hollered, fire, 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 fire. And up the street he went throwing his hat as hard as he could. He had a tent up there and everybody began to run and see what's the matter with this crazy guy. He ran up there and jumped up the pole and come right down. Is this a clown? Like, come right down, jumped up the pole and hollered, Holy Ghost and fire. And then he started preaching as hard as he could. That's, see, something attract the attention. And the best thing to attract a wayward man is Holy Ghost and fire. That's what God did. Now, Moses didn't think he could do it. He tried it on his own doctrinal standpoints, and it didn't work. But God one day spoke to him and said, Take off your shoes, Moses. I know you're a prince in Egypt, but you're nothing in my sight. Get off your shoes. You're on holy ground. Get all rid of all that stuff you got in you. And he heard a sound. He said, I'm going to send you down to deliver my people. Now, it wasn't uncertain. Now, how did Moses know that wasn't uncertain? What if he said, Who is this talking to me? What is it? Because the voice that's talked to him was exactly with the Scripture. That's how you know it's a certain sound or not, or an uncertain sound. If the scripture, if the voice talking to you isn't scriptural, then don't listen to it. Amen. But if it's scriptural, hear it, because it's God's voice. See, He said, "I have heard the cries of my people, and I have seen their task, the suffering, and their taskmasters what they've done, and I have remembered my promise and my covenant." See, Moses said, "That's exactly the scripture." Now, that's what you want to do. Hear what kind of a sound it's got. See, where it's a scriptural sound. If it's scriptural sound, then it's a certain sound because God's promises is true. If the Bible, if you hear some little scholar come out of the seminary and say, oh, there's no such thing as divine healing, that's all worked up. Listen, brother, that's a tinkling brass and a sound and symbol. Don't you listen to that? Yes, sir. But when you hear him say, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, that's a, that's a certain sound. That, that's exactly. I'm the Lord, heals all thy diseases. That's a certain sound. See? That you listen to the certain sound, not the uncertain. Now, and Moses went down and delivered the children because he had a certain sound. The Hebrew children heard a certain sound, no doubt, that night in the prayer meeting. Our God's able to deliver us. <laughs> Nevertheless, we won't take nothing else but his word. We're standing just exactly true to it. No matter what happens, we're going, it's a certain sound. That's right. They know what they was talking about. Abraham, a farmer, 75 years old, probably been a heathen. Come down from the Babylon Tower where they had all them superstitions up there and so forth. But one day while he was working out in the field, he heard a sound and it was a certain sound. Twenty-five years later with no evidence that sound would ever be made manifest, he believed it just twice as much as he did at the beginning. Now, yeah. God said, Abraham, you're going to have a wife, going to have, your wife's going to have a baby and, it, and uh, she's 65 years old now and you're 75, but I'm the Lord. I, I'm going to take that baby and through that make you a father of the nations of the world. I'm just going to make you a father of many nations now. And after a while he met him and changed his name and called him from Abraham, Abram to Abraham, giving him part of his name, Elohim. And so because he was a father and made him a father of nations. Now, Abraham just kept believing that promise. 
First month, second month, first year, third year, fifth year, twenty-fifth year, he still believed it. And the Bible said that he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong, giving praise to God. He, he heard a certain sound, no matter how long it takes, that don't have nothing to do with it. It's the sound that's right, no matter what it is. Oh, if you could just get that, church, it'd all be over, I'm telling you. Things would be different if we could just get that. See, that's certain sound that it's God. God. How do we know? He said so. How do you know, Abraham, you're going to have this baby by Sarah? God said so. Well, look here. She's 65. I don't care if she's 60, 100. No matter what it is. God said so. That settles it. I guess you, if it, oh, I'll, I'll come around next year and see how, how that baby's getting along. After nine months, I'll, I'll be back to see your baby. It might not be here in nine months. I believe it will. But if it ain't here in nine months, it might be the next nine. See? It'll be here. Years pass. Years pass. What about it? Just got stronger and stronger, saying, glory to God. God said it. Oh, I couldn't disbelieve it if I had to. Hallelujah. I have to look around here and see brother and sister kids sitting here. Well, he said, not long ago, I, a doctor made a sound and that old man was dying. You <laughs> see? And I like to burn the tires off my car get up here to say goodbye to him. But I got up in the room one morning, the Holy Spirit said, no, he ain't going to die. <laughs> here he is. I heard he's gained 25 pounds. My, my, my. So you see that? It's a certain sound, see? It's a certainty. If God said so, it's so. Amen. Just coming in from California the other day. I hadn't got my suitcase in. hadn't been home for two months. Right at two months. I got about the second suitcase in. The phone rang. There's a lady. Well, she used to be kind of a girlfriend of mine. Years ago, when I used to pass through the Milltown Baptist Church, she had two lovely daughters, and she married a fine man, a brother Huff, and he's a millwright. He'd had it, one of his fingers and thumbs cut off, a very nice brother. And they had, had two twin, or, uh, twins and a, another girl, making three children, and the twins were staunch Christians. They, they were UB uh, people, but they, they really believed God. And so... Uh, they, uh, one little girl going to school, she got a complex. The girls tell her, well, why don't you smoke like we do? You think you're better than we are? Why don't you go to dances? Now, they didn't go to dances, or neither did they smoke or drink. And they made fun of the uh, healthier girl. She said, hm, let them jump the river. I'm the one serving Christ. They don't want to. Let them go ahead. But the other one, she began to think, oh, maybe I could do something. And she built a complex, got nervous. She went insane. They had her in the institution two years. And so they're trying to doctor her, but give her all kinds of stuff and treatments and, and everything. They, it didn't work right. So then when I got in home, they said, Brother Branham, they got her over to that Catholic institution there. And Monday, they're going to send her to Madison. That's a padded cell. That does it. She's 18 years old and a genius. She's one of those perfections. She even teaches uh, opera and plays overtures and teaches music at 18 years old. See, just a real smart girl. And so um, she, a real good Christian, and they couldn't understand it. And so when they said, let's go to put her then to the padded cell, that was all they gave her. I forget how many shock treatments, and that's a shot in the dark, you know. And so it just made her worse. So the doctor said, there's not a hope for her, so we're going to take her to Madison Monday. And so uh, the little mother said, I remember our uh, brother Branham used to be down here. That it used to tell us about Christ being a healer. Said, I, and I've heard all kinds of newspaper reports and things uh, about where he's been, this country people way back out in the country. And so, and said, um, if I could just get a hold. So they called Jeffersonville, the office, and they said, I was in California, be home at a certain date. Said, well, I'll just give us, I think I was on a Friday. You want to come in? That'd be Monday. They go take her away. So he went and asked the doctor if I could come over. And the doctor said, no. No, don't get her worked up. Said, they, nothing can be done for it. The psychiatrist and them were there. So they went ahead, and Brother Huff said, look, it's a Catholic hospital. Said, our brother, it's just like if you was going to give the last rites or something, a priest, he said, well, it's nothing can be done. So let me talk to that preacher. I said, all right. He gave him my number. He called. I was out. Said, and told my wife, call him back. I called all day Saturday and all, all night, up till 12 o'clock Saturday night. Never did come in. I seen his give me the dodge, you see, keeping him coming over. And Brother Huff called and said, Brother Brandon, go take her Monday. I said, tell you what, Brother Huff, he don't know me, so you take me in as a visitor. Just let me go in as a visitor. And um, he said, all right. So the next day he come up to get me as a visitor. And the, his, the twin, one of the twins, and the other little girl got in the car to go over with me. We went over the river. And so the mother and father drove ahead. And I began to question the girl. said, you know the funniest thing uh, Brother Branham said this morning? Lovely little thing. She said, you know, our pastor said started to preach on a certain thing. And he, 
changed the subject and began to talk about healing by oral and said, Papa and Mama started crying because, and we did too, because we knew you were coming to get you. He said, there's some kind of healing that people does in the Bible by oral. I said, uh-huh, sis. I said, I know what you're talking about. She said, you think that could have been pertaining if God was trying to tell us through our pastor of something we had a chance that way? I said, we'll see when we get over there and see what the Holy Spirit says. And when they open the door, you know, they unlock the door and then lock it back behind you, unlock the elevator and take you up and then lock it back again, you know, keep the people, put you into the cell, set there a pretty little thing, little 18-year-old, little darling about that high, great, big, soft, pretty eyes, sitting there, just, just, oh, just in a terrible condition, just like that. And I said, you remember me, Margaret? She said, oh, oh, oh. And I said, I'm Brother Brandon. Don't you remember me? Billy used to call me down there. You know, I, when you come, it's like a little pumpkin seed, a little bitty girl the last time I seen you all, little bitty dresses like that. Don't you remember me? I said, oh, great big eyes, you know, looking like that. I thought, oh, God. And I sat with my, just kind of put my leg across the end of the bed. There's a man sitting there trying to hold his wife. She is in terrible condition. This girl sitting here, and the father was standing by the girl. The mother sat down in the other corner of the bed. We were sitting there. I kept wondering, Lord, will you say something? Will you say something? I said, don't you remember me, Margaret? And I just kept on looking at me. She couldn't make out nothing. I said, Brother Bram, she only thing she keeps talking about is about blood and on the highway and things like that. I said, funniest things. And I said, how long has this been going on? I said, two years. And I kept talking to her. Oh, but the grace of God. Just in a few minutes, the Holy Spirit began to move in. I said, Margaret, you don't know me, but I said, all your life, since you've been big enough to know about boys, you always had in your mind you was going to marry a preacher. You want to marry a preacher. And she started to smile. That caught. See, I seen the Holy Spirit had it. And then I said, Thus saith the Lord, it's over. I thought, what did I say? Many of you read about the squirrels and so forth. I said, it's over. Well, I thought, if he said that, I'm staying right with it. I said, Brother Huff, I don't know why I said that. I cannot tell you. I said, I just said it. Now, that's all I know. Just said it. And I said, but you just watch. In the next few hours, there's going to be a change in here. That's about 5 o'clock in the afternoon. I said, there'll be such a change in here in the next few hours. I just spoke of it that morning in the church down at the tabernacle. I guess there's some of the tabernacle folks here now. Fred Softman and them, I know, was here. That, or them down there that heard that being said. Well, I believe these boys sitting right here was down there. How many in here remember me saying at the tabernacle? Yeah, they're here. See? I said, be in prayer. I said, something's fixing to happen. Something's fixing to happen. And when I went back out, I got outside. The, they unlocked the doors and let me back out. And then when I got in the car and drove around the corner, I said, Heavenly Father, why did I say it? Why did I say it? No more than it was when said to those squirrels and so forth in the period. I said, something's fixing to happen. It was confirmed to get over here at the next meeting. This last one like that, what was fixing to take place? And when I got home, I just changed my clothes and was going back down to church. Brother Huff called me. He said, Brother Branham, I just couldn't hold it any longer. He said, you know what? After you left, about a half hour after you left, the doctors come in. He said, Margaret was sitting on the bed. And when I was sitting there, and I said, Margaret, it's thus saith the Lord. It's over. And her mother just hit me across the knee like that. And she screamed at her daughter, not even knowing what she's doing. She said, honey, he's never wrong. Like that. He's never wrong. I walked out of the building and Mr. Huff called me up and said, Brother Branham, the doctors walked in here and said, what's happened? Said, the girl's come to herself. Said, we're going to take her home tomorrow. She's dismissed. She's normally and well as anybody could be. She's home tonight rejoicing because, why? There was a certain sound. <laughs> no matter what's contrary, it's a certain sound. Oh, God. That certain sound. Just two or three more, about five more minutes. A certain sound. How we could go on. Something happened on the road the other day. Same thing. It just keeps moving in. More and more. More and more. More and more. Why? It's a certain sound. Because you're in that woods that day. Brother Fred, Brother Tom, the rest of you all here, Brother Leo, you. When that man, angel of the Lord stood there in the woods and said that thing, speak that word and watch what happened. That wasn't one certain sound. That was a sound. I know it's the truth. I believe it I, with all my heart. With this Bible over my heart. It's God. We're at the end time. Jesus, when he was on earth, wasn't the uncertain sound to him. 
He said, I have power to lay my life down. I have power to take it up again. Yeah. Nothing uncertain about that. No, it was a certain sound. Why? He had heard from God. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Hallelujah. Now I feel like shouting. I feel religious now. Now we're getting that off an agony side into the positive. A certain sound. If the trumpet gives an uncertain sound, who can prepare himself? But the trumpet sounding. We're at the end time. It's with the Scripture. It'll be light in the evening time. These signs and so forth. It, it's here. The trumpet gives the right sound. Let's prepare ourselves. That's right. Let's get ready. Something's fixing to happen, brother and sister. Jesus said, I have power to lay my life down. I have power to take it up again. Not maybe I will. I hope I have. He said, I have. Amen. Amen. That's it. Amen. When Martha come out to meet him, when Lazarus has been dead four days, said, Lord, if you'd have been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, whatever you ask God, God will give it to you. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and life. Now I hope I am, I am. Amen. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Leave us out of this. No uncertainty about that. I am. I will be. I hope to be. I am now. I always was and I always will be. I am the resurrection life. I am. I am. <laughs> yes. There's nothing uncertain about that. Or have you laid him? <laughs> Amen. Nothing. I will, now, now, remember, I'll go see what I can do about it. I'll go and wake him. <laughs> nothing uncertain about that. That was it certain. Yes, Why? God had told him so. Amen. Right. Amen. I do nothing till my Father shows me first. St. Right. John five nineteen. Verily, verily, I say to you, the Son can do nothing in himself but what he sees the Father doing. Amen. What the Father does, he shows the Son. Amen. Amen. Nothing uncertain about that. Amen. He's dead. He's rotten in the grave. But I'm going to wake him. Hey. Amen. I go wake him. No uncertainty, and that's remember that he that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Amen. Nothing uncertain about that. Amen. That's as true as God is true. Amen. Oh, aren't you glad that he knows you? Aren't you glad that your name's on his yes, book? He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Thank you. Amen. I am the resurrection and life. And I'm in Him. God proved by raising Him up. He raised me too. I'm already sitting in heavenly places resurrected. As far as God's concerned, those who He foreknew, He called. Those who He called, He justified. Those who He has justified, He hath glorified. Amen. Right now, it is... In a stage of glorification, Amen. setting in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, Amen. in a glorified state with the power of the resurrection in us, that's Amen. changed us from a sinner to a Christian. Nothing uncertain about that. No uncertainty. How do you know it's living in me? How do you know it's in you? Amen. That's the reason these things are taking place. Nothing uncertain about it. We pass from death unto life. Because we're alive. He that were dead, though he believeth in me, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. All that believes in him and comes to him, I give him eternal life. Right now we have an eternal life. Amen. And we'll be raised up in the last days. Amen. Ah, that's it. Nothing uncertain about that. No, oh, it's already done. No man can come to me except my father calls him. And all the Father hath given me will come to me. How many Christians raise your hands? Amen. Well, you're already in a glorified state. Amen. 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 All the Father give me will come. And all that comes, I will no eyes cast out, give him eternal life, and raise him up to the last day. I will. Maybe I will. No, I will do it. Amen. That's a certain sound. That's certain. We're coming forth in a glorified state. This mortal upon immortality. Nothing uncertain. What are we scared about? Oh, hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Bless the Lord. Nothing to be excited about. Nothing to be, be uh, scared about. I mean, 
Oh, my, why? It's nothing uncertain. We're certain. I'll bring him forth. This mortal shall be take on immortality. It does not yet appear what kind of a body we shall have, but we know we'll have a body like his own glorious body, for we shall see him as he is. Amen. 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 Nothing uncertain about it. We shall see him. Amen. Glory. God. Nothing uncertain. It's all certain. Oh, you can go ahead and take that uncertain sign if you want to, but I like the gospel trumpet that gives a certain sign. Yeah. What is the gospel trumpet? <laughs> Good news. <laughs> That's right. He's here now. Now, nothing uncertain about it. All right. He didn't say, I'll go down and see what I can do about Lazarus. I'll go down and find out what I can do. I'll go down and try and see if I can raise him up. He shall rise again. Amen. That's certain positive. Well, he say now, you talk about Jesus. You talk about Abraham. What about you? Yep, we got certainty to do. Get a little while, the world sees me no more. But you'll see me. For I will be with you. That's a certainty. Yes, sir. Amen. A certainty. I will. Maybe I will. Perhaps I will. No, I will. Amen. That's certain. Yes. I will be with you even in you. <laughs> you can call fanaticism if you want to, but it's a sure sound to me that I'm saved. <laughs> Amen. Amen. I will be with you even in you to the end of the world. Amen. That's a certainty that you'll know. How do you know that you're certain? All right. Works that I do, shall you do also. That's a sign. I'll give you a sign to prove. To prove that I'm with you. It won't be no uncertain. You say, well, how will I know whether I'm emotional or not, whether I'm worked up or not? These signs shall follow them that believe. No uncertainty. How do we know whether we're Christian or not? Now, we go in all the world and preach the gospel and are baptized and so forth. How do we know that we're, we're Christian? These signs shall follow them. I'll give you a certainty. A certain sound. A certain sign. Well, here's what it'll be. The preacher says, come. Join our church and recite our creed or be baptized or sprinkled or poured or oh, whatever more. See, and that, that's it. Jesus never said nothing about that. That's uncertain sound. You say, well, my mother belonged to this church. That's very fine. Well, I, I tell you, I walked up and was confirmed. That, that, that's all right, too, but that, that's, not, that's still uncertain. Jesus said, I'm going to give you a certain sign. <laughs> These signs, Mark 16, the last words he said to his church... Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. How far? All the world. How many? Every creature. It ain't nothing like mission and millions and billions and billions untouched yet. See? Now, he, he said, well, now, they say it ended with the disciples. No, no. Here's certain sound. All the world and every creature. Amen. That's certain. When the gospels preach, these signs shall. Not maybe they will. They ought to. They will. Amen. That's certain. Oh, brother, I'm glad to be Pentecostal in heart. <laughs> yes, sir. Oh, these signs shall. It's certain. These signs certainly will follow those that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils, speak with new tongues. If they should take up serpent or drink deadly thing, it wouldn't harm them. If they lay their hands on the sick, they shall recover. Certain signs. As it was in the days of Noah, how you know we're at the end time? What will it be at the end time, Lord? Well, how we know we are at the end time? As it was in the days of Lot, so shall it be. So shall. Not maybe it will. It ought to be at that time. No, it will be. <laughs> the same Spirit dwelling in human flesh, discerning your thoughts of the heart, told who was behind him. You know how, what I mean. We're at the end time. Amen. Amen. It shall be as it was in the days of Lot. Somebody's got to rise up. Something's got to do it. But it also said in the end time, what, how the church is going to be lukewarm, fall away. It will be. No need to try to stop it. It will be. But there's some in there. He stood. The only church age of the seven church ages, the lady is seeing is where Jesus was found outside his church knocking on the door trying to get back in. That's right. The only church age. Yes, sir. And the Lady of Sin, Pentecostal church age, so-called, they had made so many creeds and denominations to set Jesus on the outside. And he was standing at the door knocking. <laughs> All that I love, I rebuke and chasten. Now, don't get mad at me. And I tell you, you ought to leave your hair grow and quit smoking cigarettes and, and quit wearing shorts and doing all these kind of things and live like Christians ought to. See, all I love, I chasten and rebuke. Be zealous and repent. 
what he said. Thank you, Lord. And he that will open the door and let me in, I'll come in and sup with him and he with me. Hallelujah. I will, if you just open the door. Not maybe I will, I'll think it over, I will. I will come in to everyone that will open the door. All them certain sounds. I love that, don't you? Yes, sir. You say, well, now, Brother Branham, I'll tell you what I did. I, I went and joined the church. I believe now that I was saved. That isn't what it is. Uh -uh. Peter said on the day of Pentecost, said, repent, every one of you. Be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And you shall receive the Holy Ghost. Uh, no, no, may, uh, you, maybe you will receive it. <laughs> no, 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 maybe about that. You shall receive it. Amen. For the promise isn't to you, to your children. And to them in Middletown, or as many as the Lord our God shall call. It's certain. And as many as received him, to them gave he the power Glory to, God, to become the sons of God. The sons, as many as believed, was added to the church. How do you get in the church? By one spirit. We're all baptized into one body. Nothing uncertain about it. It's certain. A certain sound. If I don't run two or three tapes out here, Leo, <laughs> I'll stop. I just oh, keep you here a half the night. Oh, my. Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. Is that right? Amen. He'll be part of the way. He, he'll be some of the... Uh, he'll be the same. No uncertainty about that, is there? Not at all. All right. He that believeth on me has eternal life. No, nothing uncertain about that. He that heareth my words and believeth on him that sent me has everlasting life. Nothing uncertain about that. Is that right? It's a promise of God. Repentance towards God. And be filled with the Holy Ghost. Divine healing and all those things are certain. It's the promises of God. These signs shall follow them that believe. Now you say, Brother Branham, I belong to the assemblies. That's good. I just soon belong to the assemblies as any church. It's a fine church. One of my greatest sponsors is the Assemblies of God. I belong to the Church of God. Well, good, I do too. Church of God, and I belong to the Assemblies also. See? And uh, uh, Church of God, one of my great sponsors. I belong to Four Square. You say, well, I do too. See? Uh, they're a fine church, I, 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 a fine group of people. There's just only one church in all of them. They're all together as a church, but uh, that, them groups are fine. See? I belong to the United. For sure, I do too. See? They're fine. Fine brothers. See? All right. I belong to them too. I belong to them because I'm in the same church they are. Every one that's been filled with the Holy Ghost because by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body. Amen. Is that right? Amen. Now, that, that, that's not an uncertain sound. That's 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter. By one Spirit we're all baptized into one body and become members of that body. Amen. Amen. Thank you, now, here's what it is. At that day, Jesus said he would separate the sheep from the goats. He promised that there'd be a, a, a sheep and a goat. And, uh, and he promised there would be a, a wise virgin and a sleeping virgin. They're going to be there. Everything he says is certain. And I, I'm so glad tonight to know that, that beyond any shadow of doubt, I've been born again of the Holy Spirit. You, you, you love that? You believe in that? <clears throat> now, that's where I'm standing just like... And making this remark in closing, Paul Rader, uh, a friend of mine, I quoted him a few minutes ago on his death when he was going. Paul Rader said one time that he used he come from Oregon, that's where his home was, and he used to cut timber. And he said one time he, his boss and he's in a dream, and his boss sent him up to cut a, a, a certain tree at a certain size, and, and he got the tree cut, and he just put the axe in the log, and a man's greatest muscles is in his back but when he goes to lift. He lifts with his legs, arms, back. He's more stronger in his back than any part of his body. So he got a hold of the log and put his knees together. And he just wrestled and wrestled and wrestled and wrestled till he just simply couldn't go any farther. He just wore himself out. said, I was just so depleted till I just couldn't move. I was so weak. And what was happening, he's a missionary overseas. He's way back in there and there's a lot of what they call blackwater fever. I think that's what it was that Paul had. No doctor around, no word. Paul was a great believer in divine healing, if you all knew it. And he was a great man. Billy Sunday came to Chicago one time to preach a few meetings there with the Chicago Gospel Tabernacle. And um, 
And so Paul was up there preaching, and Billy preached about a week or ten days, and he ran out of sermons. He didn't have any more sermons. And Paul had been preaching for about six or eight months there. And he said to Paul, he said, Paul, when do you ever run out of sermons? He said, when I get a kink in the hose. <laughs> He's gonna, that, that was Paul. So he went and got a kink in the hose, you know, got stopped up, something he done, something cut off the supply line, you see. That he just went to the pulpit. And you, anybody ever know Paul Rader? He'd start in Genesis and preach the Revelations and all across the Bible and everywhere else. He just got up there and started hitting away till he hit a sermon and took off on it. And so uh, he, uh, he, he got this blackwater fever and, he, and they thought he was dying. And he told his wife, said, stand nearby me, pray. Kept getting darker and darker room. Finally, he went all the way out. And that's when he dreamed this dream. And he said, and he, he guessed what it was, is that fever just had him so whipped out till he was just gone. And you know what blackwater fever is? You don't live with that. So he believed God and trusted him all the time. So he, he had his wife praying, her hands laid on him and praying. They had to go out by a canoe for days and days to get out of the place where they were in. And then he said, one, he dreamed that he tried on this log until he just wore himself out. So he just, his strength was completely gone. So he just got so wore out. He just sat down and leaned back against the tree. And he said, I'm done. I just can't lift that log. And where's all my strength gone? Well, I could lift that log and put it on my back with one hand. He said, walk away. Here's this small tree. And he was a very strong man. And he said, I could. Well, I picked up trees bigger than that any time walk with it. And said, so he's just sitting there and he's got crying. He said, all my strength is gone. I can't do nothing else. My strength is gone. And said, so he heard his bo- boss come up and said, Paul, what's the matter? And said, so he thought that b- boss had the sweetest voice he ever heard. And he said, I, I, I'm finished. I, I haven't got no more strength. I can't go any farther. I can't pick up that log. I just can't move away with it. He said, Paul. He said, what are you tussling with it anyhow? See he said, there runs a creek running right along by you. He said, why don't you just throw it in the creek there and get on it and ride on down. The camp's just below the hill. You go right down the riffle to the camp. He said, just roll it over in the creek and jump on it. Ride down. Don't let it pack you down. Well, he said, I never thought of that. He said, when he turned around, he saw who his boss was. It's his real boss. He said, he pushed it in the water. Jumped the straddle of the log. He said, he's just so happy. He began to splash in the water. And I got hollering, I'm riding on it. I'm riding on it. I'm riding on it. Going over the riffle, just this pretty flying down to the camp like hour. I'm riding on it. And said, when he come to himself, he jumped right in the middle of the floor. His wife laying over the corner where he just threw her back and screamed at the top of his voice. And I'm riding on it. I'm riding on it. I'm riding on it. And brother, that's what it is tonight. One day I found out that Jesus Christ loved me. I realized that I was born to be his child. He called me and gave me eternal life. I don't know when my death will come. I don't, it doesn't matter to me. But there's one thing sure. Every word that he promised in this book, I'm riding on it. I'm riding on it. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The baptism of the Holy Ghost is for whosoever will will come and receive it. Divine healings for everyone, whosoever will, may come and receive any blessing. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, where sinners plunge beneath the flood, lose all their guilty stains. That dying thief rejoiced to see that fountain in his day. There may I, though vile as he, wash all my sins away. Ever since by faith I saw that stream thy flowing wounds supplied, redeeming love has been my theme and shall be till I die. Then in a nobler, sweeter song I'll sing thy power to save when this poor lispering, stammering tongue lies silent in the grave. I'm riding on it, brother. I'm a riding on it. I come into the Pentecostal people. They had different organizations just like the Baptists did. I never joined up with any of them. I stood right in between the groups and know they were brothers in both all the groups around. I put my arms around every one of them like that, and they are my brothers. I'm a riding on it. The other day in Beaumont, Texas, a certain group of people, a denominational church that had 72 churches sponsored my meetings. And they had a great meeting going on. I had a brother sitting on the pulpit uh, on, up on a platform. And, and the district presbyter called me that day and he said, I resent that, Brother Branham. You had a man on the platform that was baptized wrong. He said, how could you do that? I said, why? He said, well, he, he wasn't one of ours. He, he, he couldn't be. I said, oh, he's my brother. He said, you know what we've done? He said, we've drawn a little line and cut you out from among us. I said, I'm going to draw a little line above you and cut you back in again. I said, I'll bring you back. Why, you're my brother. I'm riding on it. I don't care what they believe. I believe that Jesus Christ is not divided. Oh, one body, we, one in hope and doctrine, one in charity. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. I'm a riding on it. 
Would you like to ride on it tonight? Are you sick? Are you needy? Is there a sinner here? Say, put up your hand and say, pray for me, Brother Branham. I want to ride on God's promise. He that heareth my words and believeth on him that sent me has eternal life. I want to ride on it. I'm going to take my stand right now. Raise your hand and say, pray for me. God bless you, sir. God bless you, sir. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. That's fine. God bless you. Anybody here without the baptism of the Holy Ghost say, Brother Branham, I know the promise is mine. He told me over there in Acts 2.38, if I repented and was baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, permission of my sins, I should receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. He said over in Mark 16, go ye in all world and preach the gospel. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. These signs shall follow them that believe. Our Holy Ghost is promised to me, and I want it, and I'm going to ride on the promise until God gives it to me. Raise up your hands. Huh? Amen. All right, good. Amen. God bless you. How many of you in here say, I'm sick, Brother Branham? Maybe you're past cure. I don't know from the doctor. He can't cure you. He can age you, help you until God cures you. But I, if there's only one cure. That's God. His remedies. Doctors has remedy. God has cure. That's all. He's got many remedies, but there's only one cure, and that's to God. I'm the Lord who heals all thy diseases. I'm sick, Brother Branham. I've tried everything I know how. I, this seems like I just can't get over it. But tonight, he's the Lord that heals all my diseases. He was wounded for my transgressions. With his stripes, I am healed. I believe it, and I'm going to ride on it. I'm raising my hand. Remember me, Brother Branham, and I'll ride on his promise. Hallelujah. This is it. Now, listen, friend. I want to just... You be honest with me. How can that fail? Amen. I ask you in the name of all saints. How can that fail? If you're a sinner and you ask God to save you, He promised and even sent Christ to die that you could be saved. How can you fail being saved? Amen. Tell me where you could fail. Hallelujah. The only way is because you're up here and not down here. Hallelujah. If you say the Holy Ghost is mine, I've repented. Confess my sins, believed on Christ, been baptized. I'm ready for the baptism of the Holy Ghost. The only reason you haven't got it is because it's something's wrong up here. Amen. That's right. You're not thinking right. If it was coming from down here, you'll get it right now. Right. You say, Brother Branham, I believe in divine healing. I accept him as my healer. He was wounded for my transgressions. With his stripes, I am healed. Oh, brother. That settles it. That's all of it. The only thing, if it's down here, it's true. If it's up here, it's not true. If it isn't, then God be found a liar. He made a promise that he can't keep. He keeps it to others. What about you? Is that right? Just think of it. You say, I want the Holy Ghost. He gives it to whosoever will. Is that right? I want to be saved. Whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's what he did. See, it's you up here. It's you letting the devil use this. There's no man, when God ever makes a decision, it has to be the same decision each time if, he, if it's for something you're asking. If he saved the first man on a basis of faith, he has to save the second one coming. He has to save everyone comes. I'm riding on it. I believe it. Do you believe with all your heart? Amen. Stand up to your feet. I challenge every sinner in here, command you in the name of Jesus Christ, to tell God that you're sorry for your sins and you accept Jesus as your Savior right now, watch what happens. I challenge every believer in here that's been saved to accept Christ right now to fill you with the Holy Ghost. Take all the, Confess your sins. Just tell Him that you're sorry. That you, what is your sin? You say, Brother Brown, I'm already a Christian. Confess your sin. Your sin's unbelief. That's the only sin there is. Is unbelief. You just, your unbelief keep me away from it. Every sick person in here, you just confess your faith in his stripes we were healed. Watch what takes place. Now, how many believers is in here? Raise up your hands. Now, whether you now you know that people that raise their hands as sinners and whoever they were. I want each one of you people to lay your hands across over on somebody else near you. Just lay your hands across on one another, no matter where you are. Up on the platform. If they haven't been need healing, Lord, just let it go. Pray, our Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, we break the spell. We break every devil's power. We break it by faith as we claim the righteousness of Christ. May the devil turn loose to this church tonight and get out of here in the name of Jesus Christ, for the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, as being preached in the power.